day finds you well. Uh, perhaps a little disturbed in our spirits because of the drama that goes on all around us. Uh, and that would be normal. Welcome to those on YouTube and on the internet listening to us this day. Uh, I hope that you don't take being a Christ follower for granted. Uh, and today we're going to talk about the conflict of two worlds as we continue a series on the spirit-filled life uh, out of the book of Romans chapter 8 is where we're going to head here in a moment. Uh, good advice to tell young people okay, is don't go out of your way to find trouble because it's coming to you. And that has been proven true this week, okay? More than we could possibly know. And so we encourage young people and even the elderly, let's not go out of our way to make a lot of trouble, especially for ourselves, our friends, our family, those kind of things. Because we're gonna see that the world is actually contrary to us. Now, we're not going to talk about the conflict of the world being conflict of fire, flood, hurricane, uh, and, and earthquake, uh, all of these things. Those are, we call them natural events. And Mike did a great study this morning talking about the Sea of Galilee and the great storm that came upon the disciples and Jesus Christ. And the question that we ended with that is to be a thought provoker was uh, who caused that storm to come about? And so does God use these natural events on the planet Earth? And again, see, we even use the word natural. I use the word natural all the time. Uh, we know that God has an impact on planet Earth and in fact the universe. And the universe and in fact, planet Earth responds to the very presence of God. The mountains, the valleys, the waters, the wind, the rain, the storms, they all respond to God, to his very presence as he draws near, yes, absolutely. And to his voice or his command, yes, absolutely. And that was part of our study this morning. But we're not going to address that. We're going to address the conflict that exists in the world between the moral, spiritual, and ethical conflict of Christ followers and those of the world. Last week we learned, hopefully you learned, those in Christ are selected for glory and everlasting life. That God in Christ has predetermined a victory. And it is predetermined in the sense if God says something is going to happen, I can assure you it is going to happen. I absolutely guarantee you. Why? Because God absolutely guarantees us in his word that his word accomplishes the reason it was sent forth into the world. Our response, and Paul lays them out in the book of Romans, uh, especially in this chapter we've been dealing with, uh, God has and shows us that he will be working in our lives every moment of every day of our lives. God is working in your life. Now, if you don't feel God's working in your life, let me explain. God is working in your life. Okay? Whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not, whether you feel it or not, God is working in your life. If you are in a desert place or a place of distress or trauma or drama, God is working in your life. If you're a Christ follower, God is working in your life. For those who aren't followers of Christ, God could be leading, drawing them to himself. And he does that through all kinds of different mechanisms. God has a plan and a purpose for each Christ follower. Every single one of us. God has a plan and a purpose for you as an individual, just as he has a plan and a purpose for a congregation, a body of believers called the church. There is a plan, there is a purpose. What is it? I have no clue. <laughs> we glorify him the best we can each day. We walk it out each day. And uh, boy, isn't the next day a surprise? And boy, it has been this week. 
God provides help and comfort to each believer. Always. Help and comfort in the form of the Holy Spirit in a spirit-filled life. Paul has already expressed that God helps us in our weaknesses. He comes alongside. He comforts us. Now, he may very well use, as you know, a brother or sister to come alongside someone. To comfort them. To give them some kind of encouragement. We pray for that every day here. Every time we get together, that we would be encouraged by the Holy Spirit of God and that we would, in some senses, feel comforted, even amidst trouble. God has selected the elect for a destiny in glory forever. And God has predetermined that. In fact, we've learned that God has determined not only our destiny, glory, our future, it's already set. It's already established in stone, can't be changed. Already figured out by God. He has determined their times, the people's times, yours specifically, our nation's times, the world's times. He has determined the boundaries of who goes where and how you get there. And he has determined the habitation, what you do while you're there, how you live. God's already determined that. And he's already figured it out. The problem is, we don't know it. And so we try to figure it out each day. Well, while we're figuring that out, there's a problem. There's a conflict. If you look in Romans chapter 8, verse 31 is the start of our text for today. We're going to spend some time in Romans, but we're also going to spend a lot of time in John, the Gospel of John, and 1 John. Uh, Romans 8, 31. What shall we say to these things? And it's those things I just mentioned. All of those things. If God is for us, who is against us? Now it's an overhead question that Paul asks. If God is for us, who is against us? When you consider all the things we just mentioned, the answer would be nobody, nothing. But then we look and go, no, no, no. There's all kind of things against us. And again, I'm not counting the natural disasters of the world that God can use to form us increase our faith now the psalmist declares that God is for us in Psalm 118 he says the Lord is for me I will not fear what can man do to me the Lord is for me it's a it's a statement of fact if these things are true and it's true that God is for the Christ follower then all those things are true then <clears throat> what can man do to you well we're gonna find out what man can do to you okay because that's what our minds automatically go to that. We automatically, in our humanness, go to those things. So we're going to explain this a little bit out of John chapter 15, if you would turn there. Gospel of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You see, we are in this world. We are not of this world. Christ is going to explain that to us in these following verses. And, but we get pretty enamored with the world. We get pretty enamored with our nation. We fall in love with our culture. We fall in love with our community. In fact, our church even. And so and some of those things are good things. But in John 15, verse 19, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. I, whoa. That's pretty dramatic. The world in this word is the word cosmos. It means really an orderly arrangement. It means how it's all put together. And it means how it's all put together and what it contains. Okay. Uh, the physical and spiritual arrangement of things. One author said, if you were actuated by the principles of the world, if, like them, you were vain, earthly, sensual, given to pleasure, wealthy, ambitious, they wouldn't oppose you. Because the world loves those things. The world produces those things. And they expect you to be involved in those things. But Christ has declared that he has chose you out of the world. He has grabbed you, pulled you out of the world. Even though you physically reside on planet Earth, 
I am not of the world. I'm of his world, his kingdom. And so I speak thus, and so should you. And we should think thus. And we sang about that. We sang about that very thing today. The world loves the pagan system it produces. How could the world be in love with the culture? And now just think of our culture, because I'm really old. But if you look at how could the world love the culture that we have built today? How could they be enamored, just over the top in love with that? But yet they do. They do. The world loves and supports the culture of the time because the cultures change. And thank you, God, that they change. Sometimes they change for better, revival. Sometimes they change for worse, rebellion. And so we see these things. I would like to think that most of the people in the world, even the unsaved, appreciate certain things. They appreciate the fact that you're honest, that you don't lie, that you don't steal, that you don't rob, that you're probably not a serial killer. Okay? Most of the world, at least, even in our country, appreciate those things. Uh, so some characteristics of the Christ follower are valued by others. But there are some things the world cannot tolerate. They'll tolerate all the good things that you bring. That's true, because they like those, because that supports their culture. The things they can't tolerate, and I've listed five of them this morning. The narrow, first is the narrow way of salvation. They cannot tolerate the fact that salvation is very specific. It's outlined in the Bible. It's very narrow. Narrow is the way. Few find it. They can't tolerate that. It should be that any way leads to God. It should be that any choice you make or any decision you make is acceptable by God. And there's lots of ways to God. And in fact, no, there is not. All of the ways to God that people come up with uh, are wrong. Unless they're coming up with Jesus Christ. Because secondly, Jesus Christ is the one and only way to God. John 14, 6, right? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father, but through me. Oh, that, that's too narrow. No, it can't be through him. It's through a prophet. It's through a church. It's through a culture. It's through form and function. That's how you get saved. And you say, none of that's true. It's through Christ. I know it's through prayer. No, it's through Christ. I know it's through giving. No, it's through Christ. I know it's through singing really loudly. No, it's through Christ. The world doesn't like that. They hate that. Third, they hate the idea that the Bible calls mankind sinful. Uh, and the fact that they'll be judged for that sin. How many of you like someone coming up, putting their finger on the end of your nose, and saying, you are wrong. You are wrong. You're a sinner. <sighs> Hair stands up on the back of your neck. What do you mean you're calling me wrong? Who are you to judge me? They use that word. Lots of pagans know don't judge lest you be judged. They might know John 3.16, but they know that Matthew 6 passage really well. Okay? That sin is judged. And in fact, fourthly, they hate the fact that certain of their activities are listed by God as sins. In the Bible, they're actually listed. And they, they call it today lifestyles. Well, I have a different lifestyle. You have a sin problem. Isn't that what the Bible says? I was born this way. Well, partially, you were born with a sin nature. I'll address that in a moment. Okay? 
Uh, but you chose the sin that you're involved with. We all did. Sometimes we still do. But the fact is, God lists clearly from one end of the Bible to the other end of the Bible a whole litany of sinful behavior, activities, and actions. And there's no way that you can take and pull them out of there and make them right. Unless you just, of course, disregard the Bible. Disregard the words of Christ. Disregard the word of God. If you throw that out, well, then you don't have a list of bad things. So people like that. I don't want a list of bad things in my life. I want to hear that everything I'm doing is wonderful and marvelous and glorious. Because we like that. And then fifthly, they absolutely do not like, they hate the absolute truth of the word of God. That the word of God is absolute truth. They hate that. There are many truths. Truth is what you choose to believe. Uh, and that's an error also. No. There is but one truth. The truth of the word of God. That's the truth. And it is absolute. Just as we started. Those things God has determined to happen will absolutely happen. Those promises he has given are absolute promises that will be confirmed and come about. Now, the world hates, and that word means to detest. In fact, it means something more than that. Not only do you detest something, but you actually work against that something, that you actually are involved. And mostly it's followed in the line of persecution. And so, since the world hates those things, if you mention any of those things, the world, they hate that. And they will find a way to persecute you. They're finding a way in the world today to persecute the Christ follower because the Christ follower is involved with hate speech. And it's very common today. It wasn't so common a few years ago, but it's very common today that you're speaking against certain groups of people. You're, you're speaking against certain lifestyles. No, God has already spoken against sin. Whoever's involved with it, that's what they're involved with. Go down the road from the Gospel of John to 1 John. Clear to the right in the New Testament. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. 1 John 2, 15. The Apostle John, and I want, and I want to frame this just a tiny bit. The Apostle John, especially in the book of the Gospel of John, considers himself beloved by God, by Jesus Christ. He calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. He forms an intimate relationship with Christ. There, Christ loves him. And he knows it. And he resides closely to Christ at their dinners and those kind of things, at special events. Guess who's right beside Christ? John. And so John knows what Christ loves. For example, he loves me. Right? That's what John knows. So when he writes 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, and there's lots to this, but we're just going to pick out a verse here. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him and you go oh wow ugh. do not love the world or the things in the world what is John talking about remember who he is and the relationship he has with Christ and now he says don't love these things in the world in fact if you love them the love of the father is not in you John is not talking about the created order the thing of the world the world is the created world. It is the universe. It is what God has produced. And even in a judged and destroyed world from the Genesis flood to today, look how beautiful it is. Now, other than smoke and fire, okay? If that fire was controlled and in a nice little box and it was a little cool outside and it's dark uh, and you got your cup of cocoa, it's pretty nice. 
And in fact, you find yourself just kind of mesmerized by it. And lots of people do. They have a, a thing on the TV that you can click on that just shows a fireplace with fire going. So you can just click on your TV and it's like you have a fireplace. I've actually watched that. <laughs> I want to see, what did it burn out? What did they do? Okay. But there are certain things that God has made that is so extraordinarily beautiful. There's some creatures on the planet that are amazing. They are literally, that's amazing. That they display so many colors and abilities. It's just amazing. Certainly, I love the beauty, the splendor, the majesty that God has provided in the world. What about the world? And the world also means the world of mankind. Okay? I find myself loving you all. I truly do. I love God's people. When we were, Patty and I are out doing the missionary work for years, we went out and did the uh, creation evangelistic uh, ministry. And we went to tons and tons of churches all over the Pacific Northwest, uh, Oregon, Idaho, California. Uh, and it was amazing. And in almost every church that we went to, uh, we could see the body of Christ. You could feel the body of Christ their love, their appreciation for God, His Word. And it was, it was encouraging to see that throughout the country. Because you hear that nobody else cares. So you get that idea. Well, that's not true. There's lots of people who care. There's lots of godly people who love the Lord and serve Him faithfully and diligently. And I love them. And you should too. In fact, no extra charge for this public service announcement. If you feel led to be involved in God's mission or ministry in some form or another, see Miss Brooke. Miss Brooke, raise your hand. Right over there. She's our ministry coordinator now. And she'll be able to tell you, what do you want to do? What are you good at? What do you like to do? And she'll be able to plug you in right here. Okay? And she'll put your name on the list. <laughs> there it is. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for playing, Brooke. <laughs> so. Okay. Those things we love. But as we've already stated, the world has a set of desires, principles, goals that are apart from God, and those I do not love. In fact, the next verse, 1 John 2.16, describes those things. John points out, for all that is in the world, all, the world contains everything about the world as far as its principles, its ideologies, what it does is contained in three phrases. The first is the lust of the flesh, the second is the lust of the eyes, and the third is the boastful pride of life. He says, is not from the Father, but is from the world. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life. These are three categories, if you will, or pits, if you will, that all sin will fall into. All sin. Doesn't matter what type of sin it is, it's one of these. And in fact, for some of us, it's all three of these. Because, you know, we don't want to leave a sin out. And so when we look, John says, the world's passing away in verse 17. And also it's lust. But the one who does the will of God abides Forever. What do you over the top, and lust is a, a over the top type of adoration or desire actually, okay? What do you over the top adore? What do you over the top chief in your life? What do you love? And husbands, the wives are all looking at you right now. So you go, er, good answer. All that is in the world, all that makes up the culture, the priorities of the culture, what they say and do, falls into lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and pride of life. These three categories are all focused on one simple phrase. It's the phrase, I. I. I want this. I like this. Look what I have done. 
I will do this. Look what I have accomplished in my life, in my work, in my family. Look, I, 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 I. Satan loves that. The world loves that. In fact, they're all focused on that. You've heard me say it before. You can't hardly watch a news event and not have them go to somebody. You know, here's a 70-year-old a serial killer. And who do they talk to? The high school basketball coach. What's your opinion of so-and-so? Well, he was a good kid, rough around the edges. I could see why he would be a serial killer 70 years later. <laughs> I just marvel at those things. Okay, what makes you think your opinion is valuable? Really? My opinion, valued by millions throughout the world, right? That's what we think. Uh, it's not your opinion that counts at all. It's God's opinion. What does God think? Not what I think. Now, we do have opinions. That's true. But is it a godly opinion or a worldly opinion? opinion. All of this, these three categories, focus around the I phrase. It is the world view of self-gratification and self-aggrandizement. Make yourself look great and good. Back to John 15, if you will, the, the uh, book of John. Christ again reminds us in verse 20 of John 15. Remember the word that I said to you? And I thought, wow, what word? If I said, hey, remember what I told you last week? You'd be going, what? Sometimes Miss Patty goes, I remember I just told you that. You did? Today even? Yeah, five minutes ago. Yeah, sure. I try to save myself, which I can't. Okay. Uh, remember the word that I said to you? Remember the word of Christ. Do you remember the words of Christ? Do you remember the Bible? A slave is not greater than their master. If they persecuted me, look, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. Since the world does not keep the word of God, they persecute those who do keep the word of God. That's why if you speak the word of God, you will be persecuted. It's not a if you will, you will. Okay? Now we look at uh, persecution today as being just kind of mocked or ridiculed or that kind of thing. Uh, but we're fast approaching the days when you speak the word of truth, you are got a set of handcuffs put on you and you're headed to jail or that you're imprisoned. We're fast approaching those days. Now they'll call it something different, but that's what it is, remember? Because they hate the word of truth. The world persecutes believers. It, Christ said they will. It's not that they might or they could be, it's they will. But verse 21, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake. Oh, great. I'm very persecuted, but it's because I'm a Christ follower. And that is a glory. That is a glory. John addresses this. Peter addresses this. Paul certainly addresses this. Suffering for Christ. Because they do not know the one who sent me. The conflict exists between the world because it does not know, truly know God. And they don't believe in God. They might say they do, but they truly don't. It's interesting, and I think it was Brother Mike at one time, I, I think. Uh, standing in Yellowstone, uh, guys are going off, and the guy says, yeah, this whole place could just blow up at any second. Uh, and he says, you don't really believe that. He goes, well, yeah, I do. He said, no, if you really believe that, you wouldn't be standing here telling us this thing is going to blow up every second. You'd be out of here. That's a little paraphrase of his account. Okay. Look at Yellowstone today. Okay. Wow. Interesting events happening on earth. You know, when I see all these things and you just kind of start putting them all together, I go, 
Okay, it's here. <laughs> You're coming, right? Okay, amen. Yeah. Conflict exists because the world does not know God. They do not love God. They don't appreciate anything about God. Uh, <clears throat> that's it. But verse 22. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have sinned. But now because they have no excuse for their sin. You see, at one point, God overlooked the times of ignorance. Ignorance. He overlooked those things. They were still there. People like it when we overlook their sin. But Jesus says, this is sin. Stealing sin. Well, those who were working as tax gatherers and collectors were stealing they were not necessarily with a gun robbing people, but pretty much the same thing. That's why they were hated by their people, because they were thieves. Maybe not all of them. And Christ looks at Levi and says, follow me. And he gave that sinful, I'm going to call him that, tax gatherer, the chance to be drawn to glory and to be used as one of Christ's disciples. What a great thing. What a marvelous thing. The world hates us because of that. In fact, verse 23, he who hates me hates my father also. Have you ever asked people, do you believe in God? Oh yeah, I believe in God. What do you think of Jesus Christ? <sighs> now they got a little trouble. They don't like hearing his name. You mention Jesus Christ and people don't like that. They don't mind swearing it and using it as a blasphemy, but they don't like hearing it that he's like a real person, that kind of thing, even though we know for a fact he is. They hate him, which means they hate the Father. That's how it lines out. To hate Jesus is to hate God. To malign Jesus is to malign God. To blaspheme against Jesus is to blaspheme against God. God clearly outlines the sin of mankind, the moral, spiritual failures that the world is wrapped up in, and the world hates it when you point that out. John 17, <clears throat> turn there. Jesus' prayer, you should read that whole chapter, chapter 17. <clears throat> People say uh, the Lord's Prayer, they think it's the Matthew 6 prayer. Okay, uh, <clears throat> But actually, the high priestly prayer, as it's actually noted sometimes, the real prayer is John 17. A whole chapter, and it's a prayer from Jesus to God. And in verse 14 of John 17, I have given them thy word. Look at that. And why? And what? The world has hated them. Hated who? Those that Christ has called into service, given them the word, says go speak the word. They go speak the word, and the world hates it. Because they're not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus walked on the earth, but he was not earthly. We tread upon the ground, but we are not earthly. He's already made that clear in the gospel. You are called out of the world. V verse 15, I do not ask thee to take them out of the world. Man, I wish he hadn't prayed that. <laughs> No, I don't really. Okay? But it would be kind of handy when you accept Christ, truly accept him, poof, you're out of here. You're in glory. Right? But God has so much more for you to do after you accept Christ. To share his word with those around you who are going to hate you saying it. Keep them from the evil one. Don't take them out of the world. But don't let the enemy step on their throat and hold them down. Keep them from the evil one. I am more than delighted that Christ prayed that for us. Because he does. He prays that for himself first. Then there's three parts to it. Himself, the apostles, and then the future believers in that prayer. And so when we see that, keep them from the evil one. Wow. I pray that for you. When you pray down the church phone book or pray through our prayer list that you see on our bulletin, do you pray that Christ would save you, the Holy Spirit of God would save you from the evil one keep harm from you I know you do you may not say it in those exact terms but that's the implication of it why? because verse 16 they're not of the world he just said that, he's now confirming it even as I am not of the world 
if Christ repeats something, probably we should listen. All right? And then he says, verse 17, sanctify them in truth, in the truth. Thy word is true. Sanctify means to set apart, to set apart as holy. So he sets us apart in holiness in his word. That's why the Bible is so incredibly important to us. Believers are given the word. They're expected to pass it on to those around them. The testimony of the godly stands contrary to the way of the world. This produces conflict strife, and ultimately hatred. Back to 1 John 3. I told you we'd be doing that. I did warn you. 1 John 3, verse 10. By this, and it is that expression of the word, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. Boy, people will not like to hear that. If you do not practice righteousness, you are not of God. Nor the one who does not love his brother. Oh, you mean I got to love people too? I got to practice righteousness and I have to love you. And the answer is yes. Yes, you do. Why? Because of verse 11, this is the message which we you have heard from the beginning. We should love one another because he has already stated that's the greatest of the commandment. Love God with all your heart, mind, body, soul. And the second is unto the first. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love the brethren. Paul uses that many times. John uses it a lot. He's using it right here. Okay, the love that we share. Uh, this is the message. And... So that we wouldn't be confused, he says in verse 12, Not as Cain, who was the evil one, who slew his brother. And for what reason did he slay him? Because his, Cain's, deeds were evil, and his brothers were righteous. Therefore, verse 13, Do not marvel, brethren, if the world hates you. The world will love you if you're of the world. If you're of God and his kingdom, it will hate you. The children of God love the things of God. The children of the world love the world and all that it contains. They are a product, the children of the world are a product of the devil. There is an obvious difference because they're totally opposite viewpoints. The conflict can grow into such a hatred that people want to kill those of God's world or God's kingdom. Those who speak God's word, those who stand up for Christ. <clears throat> they killed them all. Remember in John 17, he's praying for the, the boys. And every one of them were martyred, killed for this testimony, this word that they're sharing. Now, John, they tried to boil him in oil, and tradition has it that he got out of that somehow. I don't know how you get out of a big vat of boiling oil and not be a melted person. But he did. I think it was absolutely miraculous because God was going to use him to carry on not only the writing of the Gospel of John, which we're reading today, but 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and then the book of Revelation. What would happen in the future? There is a difference. Luke says, and I say to you, Christ again, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I warn you whom to fear. Fear the one who, after he has killed, has authority to cast into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. The worst the people could do to me on earth is kill me, in their view. And all they'd be doing for me is sending me to glory. Sending me to the destiny that God has already predetermined that I would have, and what a glory that would be. That's the worst they could do. Oh yeah, they might mess you up real bad and torture you a bunch first. Try to get you to renounce Christ or his word. Try to get you to convince and spit out the names of everybody you were in church with today. See, they, they're doing that around the world. So the point is there's little the world can do against the Christ follower. Even though we would consider death not so little. But as far as God's economy, you're never dead. The Christ follower lives. You're called the living. 
and you're destined to glory. Even in their hatred, their spite, their sphere of influence is not even close to the influence of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer. All you have to do is read the Voice of the Martyrs or read any of the books on the martyrs and you will marvel. You will marvel. I do. And weep. When you read the testimonies of those who have stood for Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit under unbelievable circumstances. And it gives me hope. I know that through the power of the Holy Spirit, I could do the same thing. And so could you. So could you. And that's the strength we're given by God and promised by God. And so Paul explains that back in Romans 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, well, delivered him up for us all. Amazing. Will he not also with him freely give us all things? He delivered him up. Remember Peter's first sermon back in Acts chapter 2? The first sermon. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know, this man delivered up by the predetermined plan and the foreknowledge of God, and I love this, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men, and put him to death. And God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death, since it is impossible for him, Jesus, to be held in its power. Would you like to be one of those uh, Jewish people sitting there in Peter's first message? This Jesus, whom you nailed to the cross. Well, in fact, that's true for us today. This Jesus who you, me, nailed to the cross. You see, because he died for my sin. He died for your sin. It's because of our sin. He went to the cross. And God delivered him up. God gave him up. It says that he gives us all things. Well, it's all things for our welfare, these needful things. He freely gives us. Uh, without money or price, you can't buy the blessing or favor of God. The greatest gift that he's ever given is his son. It was a free gift. That all others may be given a similar uh, gift. Again, not by money or merit or works. It's the mercy of God. And so from the beginning to the end, it's all from the grace of God. The grace of God. Barnes writes two things that we receive from this. The privilege, first and foremost, of being a Christian. We have friendship with God. Have you ever thought about that? We have friendship with God. You are a friend with God. And has been favored with the highest proof of divine love. We have assurance that we shall receive all that we need. If God would give us Jesus on the cross... He would then give us anything less than that. Right? When I do marriage counseling to young people who are getting married, uh, kind of becoming a thing in the past. Okay? But for people who are committed and want to get married, I always ask them the first question, do you love?